So, Mrs. Sitba, um, anyone who knows anything of uh, Stevenson's letters will know that he wrote her over 100 letters in the space of around two years. And she is the subject of my novel. Um, I've decided today, I come from the land of making things up, but I've decided today not, not to talk about fiction or think about fiction, which is what I do for most of my life, uh, but to try to focus on what we know about her in relation to RLS and um, beyond him and in the rest of her life. Um, so here she is. No, here she isn't. The space bar. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, so these three images, any of the images you, you choose of Francis Sitwell, are rather contradictory. Um, from the one on the left, which is a sketch by Byrne Jones, you could see her as virginal. From the one on the right, you could see her as rather rigorously intellectual. And the one that's probably found most commonly, you might almost imagine she's a bit of a tease. I think the problem is that everything we know about her is really filtered through the eyes and words of two very different men. RLS, who was absolutely smitten and uh, very verbose on the subject, and her second husband, Sidney Colvin, equally devoted but rather more reticent. The rest of our information comes from Colvin's biographer, who's a little more helpful, E.V. Lucas. Uh, Colvin says very little, but one thing he does say in regard to his wife is that women like her will inevitably cause masculine combustions, <laughs> which then have to be sort of damped down and smoothed over. So I think we can assume she had a reasonable helping of sex appeal. So it began, of course, in Cockfield Rectory, a small village in Suffolk. Louis Stevenson and Francis Sitwell were both there in 1873 because of a strong family connection to Maud Babington, who was Lewis's um, first cousin and also related by marriage to Frances Sitwell's husband, Albert Sitwell. Neither of them was in a good place at that time. She was separating from her husband and she had recently suffered the death of her 11-year-old son, Freddie. Lewis, of course, had been banished from the family home after that terrible falling out about religion. Colvin was also summoned and took part in all of this, but it was Mrs Sitwell who made the deepest impression. I have to apologise at this point to Mafalda and perhaps some of the rest of you. I'm not going to answer the question today, what happened at Cockfield Rectory, <laughs> because um, that, is, that is the subject of fiction. Today we're looking maybe not at the real Mrs Sitwell, but shall we say the non-fiction Mrs Sitwell. Anyway, whatever happened, uh, something deep and meaningful it would appear. Um, Mrs. S um, sorry, Lewis went briefly went to London, stayed with Sidney Colvin, and also in the Sitwell home. I still don't understand that. Um, after that, he went home to Edinburgh, and that is when the correspondence began. And I, I feel most of you are going to be familiar with the, the general tenor of his letters to Mrs. Sitwell. So above the line, as it were, I've outlined uh, intimations of pleasure, um, all the raptures he has about the two of them, and how much she has done for him psychologically, and his soul, and all the rest of it, and all his wonderful memories of Cockfield. Uh, below the line, the flip side, if you like, is the, um, you know, the typical lament of the distant lover. How is she? And He's worried about her health. He's particularly worried about the awful vicar and what he might be up to. She doesn't write to him enough, etc., um, etc. Et and we could say this is fairly typical of a younger man's infatuation with an older woman. And remember, she too was in a, you know, emotional um, state, emotionally vulnerable at this time. I quite like what Claire Harmon says. Um, about this relationship. She says that Francis was sensitive, brave, tender, distressed, bereaved and abused. Lewis would have fallen in love with a tenth of her. <laughs> 
so we can say that really it was almost inevitable. I'd like to look beyond, you know, sort of romantic and sexual supposition and think about why she made such an ideal correspondent. And this is a quote um, from later in her life, um, which shows that she was just very, very approachable and was always down to hear your story. The quotation goes on um, in that vein. Um, so she obviously just had that kind of personality that attracted people to tell their stories. And you can see why he would immediately respond to that. Of course, many of the early letters are almost uh, streams of consciousness. Um, or later, when he's addressing her as Madonna, a mother of my heart, and all this kind of thing. Um, there's something of the confessional as well. Um, this is something she obviously attracted. What I also think, and again this comes back to something that came up yesterday, was that Mrs Sitwell was somebody new. <clears throat> He'd never met anyone like her. She wasn't like any of his Edinburgh friends, male or female. And she was not like Colvin in the sense that she didn't have the same literary agenda. Colvin was the mentor. He was looking for publication and what to do next. But she was a completely different audience. And I wrote that word audience a few days ago without thinking about it. But of course, I do agree that although the letters are much more personal than essays, there is a sense in which this is somebody new to sort of show off to. And he's still kind of um, working up his writing skills at this point. Um, so Colvin was the perfect friend. She was the perfect confidante. And I think this was her value, not just to him, but also to us. We owe her so many anecdotes, reflections, literary experiments and unforgettable phrases. Without Mrs Sitwell, we might never have had the picnic on the volcano and many other things. Of course, what we have to try and do is imagine that there was another side to this conversation because we have these hundred letters from Lewis to Mrs Sitwell, but Mrs Sitwell um, insisted that all her replies were destroyed. Obviously, there is a story there, possibly very many possible stories. Um, so but what can we kind of put together about her and about her attitude to the whole thing? And why did she let this conversation, um, or at least his side of it, become so impassioned when she appeared to be staying loyal to Sidney Colvin at the time with whom she was in a relationship? And this is a quotation from a letter to Sidney Colvin describing her as having a rare charm about her joyousness despite her clouded life. So we can assume from this that whatever tough time she was having, she always put a brave face on things. And perhaps that humour, that good humour, was not so easy to maintain. And maybe with Lewis she felt she could drop the mask. You know, nobody can be cheery all the time. And at this point in her life, um, she could have been very much alone. Sitwell, um, you know, was if not physically, um, you know, sort of mentally estranged. None of her family were around. Her sister was still in Paris. Um, Colvin um, was exceptionally busy. Um, he was professor and, and editor and all the rest of it. And she could well have just been quite lonely and appreciated the contact with this uh, young writer and all his emotional outpourings. Something else um, which occurred to me, you might be aware of this poem, don't really have time to read it all. This was his official tribute to Francis Sitwell. And it's, um, it's almost the opposite of, of what Lady Carlyle was saying, because it says, I read, dear friend, in your dear face, your life's tale told with perfect grace. And he ends, your flowers and thorns you bring with you. <coughs> So this um, would suggest that her face reveals everything. But perhaps it wasn't her face that was really revealing everything. It was just that she revealed more to Lewis Stevenson in her letters than she revealed in her face or to other people. So I think we can assume her letters, if not romantic, were certainly revelatory. And it 
they were each saying to each other what they didn't feel they could say to other people. Does that make sense? One of the final points, <clears throat> which I've, I've been thinking about, is that, as we'll see, she did work later as a writer. And if someone has a natural tendency to write, well, they just enjoy putting pen to paper and they enjoy writing, whether it's a letter, a poem or something else. That could have been a factor, especially if she didn't have another outlet for that. Well, after 1875, this impassioned, as they call it, correspondence really faded out. But of course, there was a, a lifelong contact uh, between her and Sylvie uh, Sidney Colvin and the Stevensons. And they, they met from time to time, and letters went back and forth, though of course not in the same vein, and very often sent jointly to her and Colvin, rather to her on her own. And I think perhaps, don't want to um, get too wrapped up, but what about Fanny Sitwell and Fanny Stevenson? How did they get along? Fanny Stevenson was introduced uh, to Lewis's London friends in 1877, sorry, hope I got that right, and was actually left to stay with Mrs Sitwell because she needed looking after at the time. And I do get the impression Fanny Stevenson wasn't entirely comfortable with this, even though she was cosseted and petted, apparently. But at least during RLS lifetime, they maintained a, a superficial affection, uh, though I do think there might be a little bit of underlying envy in this quotation about my pretty friend. I wish I knew how she did it. I should like to drink from the fountain of perennial youth too. I think we've all had these thoughts from time to time. Um, but the, Colvin, of course, did not like Stan, Fanny Stevenson one bit, though he did um, admit to her sex appeal. Um, but after L RLS death, um, things did break down, and there was not really very much more being nice to each other, because there was this dreadful argument about who was going to write Lewis Stevenson's biography. And this is where Fanny Stevenson referred to a letter from Mrs Sitwell, uh, calling it a sea urchin of a letter written by a pig face. So, so much for the pretty friend of the last slide. Anyway, we need to move on hurriedly to Mrs Sitwell's life beyond the Stevensons. Sidney Colvin was the first comer. That letter written to him um, by Lady Carlyle was in 1871 and she wasn't separated from her husband officially till 1874. So she and Colvin were obviously in, I don't know about public, but acknowledged relationship while she was still married to her husband. And um, I find this quite um, sort of interesting. And actually for the rest of their lives, or most of their lives, until, until Sitwell's death in 1894, Sitwell was on the planet and around and part of everything that was going on, although we don't know much about him. Um, we can assume that their marriage, the Sitwell marriage, was okay to begin with, but in 1869, uh, he was granted a new parish in Minster in Thanet. Seems to have kept on the London house because he was secretary to the Archbishop of Canterbury, but I think the marriage was probably in trouble by this time with hints of abusive behaviour and alcoholism. Interestingly, in the census of 1871, Francis is listed twice as part of his household in Kent, but also a visitor to the home of Mary Colvin, Sidney Colvin's mother. Well, that suggests to me that Sitwell, you know, this was something that, that was happening. I don't think Sitwell could possibly have been oblivious to the fact that his wife was um, seeing, it's not quite the right word, Sidney Colvin. Another really interesting tidbit, this is the grave of um, Sidney Colvin and Lady Colvin, as she then was, and it's also the grave of Freddie Sitwell, who in, died in 1873. His father, of course, was Francis Sitwell, uh, Albert Sitwell. The grave is in Hampstead, where I don't think Sitwell had any connections, and I'm very tempted to think that even at this point, um, it was assumed that Francis and Sidney Colvin would be together for the rest of the days, 
and Freddie was almost their family, as well as uh, Sitwell's family. I'm not quite sure what to make of that, to be honest. Anyway, in um, 1874, her separation from Albert Sitwell was complete, but she had to go out and get a job. It was an ecclesiastical <coughs> separation, which meant she couldn't marry until after Sitwell's death. So she decided she would get a job. <coughs> seen this in the small version. I have to thank uh, Jude Jablonski of Milwaukee, uh, who has been a great research companion to me recently, for digging out this poster for the College for Men and Women, where Francis first worked. There were actually three lady superintendents, so perhaps that was um, some of her social media too. It was an evening school, basically. And she lived around the corner, as we know, in Brunswick Row. But as I said, um, she's often described as a reviewer, translator and essayist, but there's very little evidence for this. But here's a weighty tome um, translated from the French on the art and architecture of Venice, which must have been um, a weighty project. The only other thing I found is a review of a novel by George Herbert in the 1890s. Did she write more? Well, perhaps. Did she use a pen name? Um, maybe, but we don't know why. This is just trying to fill in the sort of background to her life beyond Stevenson. And her other connections. Her sister came back from France in 1874, um, so that would have been company. Maud Babington from Cockfield was widowed in the 1880s, and in the 1871, uh, 1891 census is actually living with Francis Sitwell, something I only discovered recently, in London. So that was obviously a very close and enduring friendship. Otherwise, I think we have to assume that Colvin's friends were her friends. She definitely had letters from Burne Jones and from his son, who was with her own son at Marlborough. So we're moving on now into the 1890s when Lewis was in Samoa and the letters were going back and forth. Colvin, of course, had become keeper of prints and drawings <coughs> at the British Museum in 1884 and his home would have been similar to the one on the left. That is uh, 11 rooms and three servants. So not just kind of living in a small room above the shop. These were quite gracious homes and a bit of a step up for somebody who had been a bit of an itinerant uh, till that point in his life. I've been pushed for time here, which is a little bit sad. Meanwhile, Mrs Sitwell was in this rather flashy looking block of flats in Marylebone. So I think it's probably unlikely she was still working in the college at that time. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure about her income. Maybe she did more writing than we know about. So what made Mrs. Sitwell happy. Well, Sidney Colvin did not appeal to anyone, and some, to everyone, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Slip of the tongue. <laughs> Sometimes um, he made Lewis absolutely mad. Um, but they got on like a house on fire. And they did eventually marry in 1903. That was uh, nine years after the death of Albert Sitwell. Um, people think this was to do with Colvin's mother, but I think there are probably very many reasons. Like, uh, Colvin was very, very busy. They'd been happily living together and apart for 20 years. Maybe everything was fine, but eventually they did tie the knot. Um, in their married lives, um, they were very happy. They champ continued to champion young writers and maintained friendships with Henry James and Elgar, the composer. What I particularly like as a sign of their affection <coughs> was that when they were together, she always called him Felix, which was the um, nickname <coughs> given to him by Louis Stevenson. So can we sum up Mrs Sitwell? It would be easy to see her as a bit of a victim, you know, waiting for years and years uh, for Sidney Colvin to pop the question. But I think that's not necessarily the case. She wasn't terribly colourful. She didn't um, <coughs> break any moulds, but I think she negotiated Victorian society very successfully. She was very happy in her later life. 
she found a man with the right connections and who worshipped the ground she walked on. Shall we leave her with the last word? The only thing she ever published um, about her meeting with, and her time with Louis Stevenson was published in Rosalind Masson's I Can Remember Robert Louis Stevenson. And this is how she concludes. She talks about the letters that he wrote to her, pouring out his difficulties and troubles. A number of these letters have been published or part published, and a great many more, too sacred and intimate to print, are still in my possession. What do you think about the bit of the tease now? Well, I think we can say that she definitely got pleasure from Robert Louis Stevenson, not just during their period of intimacy, but throughout her life. Thank you, everybody.